Bishop Sheen tells us we are all spectators at the cross. As Christians, we may not always be able to meet in the same pew, but we can meet on our knees in the shadow of the cross. The evening light begins to paint the Jerusalem sky. His crowned head is now bowed in grief and loss. The twilight winds carried his last human cry. It is finished. Gently, we take him from his cross. It began here in the upper room 2,000 years ago. This is my body. This is my blood. Remember me. In a garden he prayed to his father on a night of betrayal, torture, death, far from Galilee. When taken from his rack of torment, in a borrowed grave he lie. On the third day the angel said, He has risen, he did not die. After sharing with friends, he rose to the Father, leaving his spirit love to guide our journey. For he is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, together again. The Eternal Word Television Network presents Bishop Fulton J. Sheen's Emmy Award-winning series, Life is Worth Living. You are a loyal son of the church, the Holy Father told Bishop Sheen. You have spoken and written well of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is Joseph Campanella. Bishop Sheen's spoken and written words are a treasure for God's people of all religions. The diversity of his words reflect his certainty that it is not a unity of religion that we plead for, but a unity of religious people. This is a special telecast for this day. And it has to do with human characters. Characters in literature, some literature, live. For example, Shakespeare. And one of the reasons why the characters of Shakespeare live is simply because they are not individuals. They are species. The representatives of groups. So the characters that I'm going to talk about tonight have you and me in them. I remember some years ago, I think it was when Citizen Kane was being made. Orson Welles asked me to go out to his set to discuss another movie. He said he was contemplating doing a life of Christ. And he said, are there any limitations as to how I should present it? And I said, no, as long as you're historical and present Christ as he is. Namely, as the Son of God made man. He said, would it be all right if I depicted uh, Pharisees, for example, with wristwatches? If Sadducees had on sport clothes? And if Pilate and Herod were dressed in the robes of modern judges? And I said, no, that would make no difference, whatever. Well, he said, my idea is that the characters that are involved in the passion and in the life of our blessed Lord are enduring. Why go back and depict the Pharisees as they were in their dress? Since they are living today, I would be in the mob. There was one point that he made to, and he never did his life of Christ, but there was one point that he made, namely, he would never show the person of Christ, except at a great distance. His voice would be heard, maybe speaking the Beatitudes. And so this story, therefore, is an eternal story and it is one sometimes that is very helpful in a crisis. When I think of a crisis, I think of the bombing of Coventry Cathedral in, in England. Someone went into that cathedral once and saw all of the, the ruins, the rubble and the rubbish. Here were the broken pillars and arches 
Nothing looks sadder than a broken cathedral. And yet there was only one thing in it that was standing whole. Only one. And that was a great crucifix. It seemed almost suspended without being suspended. And over it were written the words, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And since we live in a crisis, we will now describe it. We'll describe it in terms of human hearts. You've often heard psychologists say there is not much difference between a normal or an abnormal person. Why is it they say that? It's because they have no standard. That's just like saying, well, there's no difference between the keys of a piano. There is a difference if you have a musical standard. If you have a piece of music outside of the keys, then you will know which is the right key and which is the wrong. And so there happens to be an eternal standard by which human hearts may be judged. And that standard is the cross. And all of us fit into it some way, somehow, and none too hopelessly either. Here are the three kinds of hearts and the three possible kinds of attitudes that one can take toward law, uh, life, because these are the attitudes that were taken to the cross. Now, we've, these words have, a, have a, a Greek origin and background, but they are useful because it's easy to keep them in mind once they're mentioned. One attitude of the people who stood around the cross and were involved in it was that of apathy. Another was antipathy. And the third group was sympathy. There was one group of hearts that was totally indifferent to what was going on. They were the apathetic group. There was another group that was hateful. Antipathy. And then there was another group that seemed to enter into the mystery of it all. Some with greater understanding than others. Now it remains to discover where each and every one of us fits into this catalog. And we'll begin first with apathy and describe some of the characters that were totally indifferent. And the first one with which we will begin is the character of Pilate. Pilate was in the background of the cross, but he was the one that sentenced our blessed Lord to the cross. Pilate uh, was a university man, a university man who had studied maybe pragmatism. He certainly must have studied it. He might never have had a, a James or a Schiller or a Dewey to have taught him. But at any rate, for him, there was no such thing as truth. There's only the useful. <coughs> he was the politician. He was interested in keeping up imperialism not concerned with whether a thing was right or wrong, but whether or not it was politically the expedient thing to do. And so when this prisoner is led before him, he asks him his, his background. 
And our Lord said to him, I am come to give testimony of the truth. And they who are of the truth, heareth my voice. And Pilate, summing up all of his university education in pragmatism, shrugged his shoulders and said, What is truth? What is it? Can we know it? and turned his back on it. It's very interesting that those who deny such a thing as absolute truth or right or wrong are those who sometimes will end in persecuting others. Pilate did. That's why we say he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He used every trick that a clever lawyer knew. Change of venue. Appeal to the mob. Punishment. And then even call for a bowl of water dipped his hands into that water and then lifted them up as the water fell from them like jewels in that morning sunlight. He said, see, see. I am innocent. I am innocent of the blood of this man. Seven times he said he was innocent. But he ended in crucifying him. That's one type of heart. The indifferent heart. That denies truth. Then there's another apathetic heart. It's the sensualist, man who's lived for pleasures of his body for, and who thinks of nothing else but the things of the flesh. This was Herod. Herod was a great public figure. He had done as much building as any one of the governors who ever worked in the Roman provinces. Rather a clever man. Our Lord once called him the fox. He was a Sadducee. He did not believe in immortality of the soul. And yet, after he, he beheaded John the Baptist at the suggestion of a second wife, and then saw our Lord. He thought that our Lord was John the Baptist risen from the dead. And when our blessed Lord is led before Herod, that was a quick, I mean a cheap trick of Pilate. Because Pilate, when he heard that our Lord had begun teaching in Galilee, said, well, I will send him to Herod because Herod has charge of the Galileans. <coughs> and Herod was glad glad to see him. And why? Because he hoped that he might work a miracle. Why is it that the sensual soul thinks of religion only in terms of the spectacular? It's very likely that he might have brought in who knows, maybe some water pots, having heard of the miracle of Cana. And ask that they be changed into wine. But our Lord would not answer Pilate, Herod. He was a moral trifler. 
He had rejected so many graces. He had heard the preaching of John the Baptist. And then after he stole his brother's wife and entered into marriage with that woman, at his birthday party he beheaded John the Baptist. Now our blessed Lord would not speak to him again because it would only be just another opportunity for him to trample on a grace. So what does Herod do? He robes our Lord in a white garment, <clears throat> sends him back again to Pilate. It was a great joke between these two procurators and the robe that he put on him was a white robe because all candidates for office in the Roman Empire had to wear white robes toga candida and the point of the humor and the ridicule was that our blessed Lord was a candidate for kingship how ridiculous so he robed him in white, the toga candida. Incidentally, that's where our word candidate comes from. Candidates for our public office do not wear white robes. Too much mud slinging, but in any case, <laughs> that was the way that Herod looked upon the master and his life, as you know, ended very miserably. But there were more that were apathetic. We have not only this pragmatist of a pilot, sensualist of a Herod, but you have the man with the acquisitive spirit, the man who loves money. And that was Judas. He belongs in this group of the apathetic because a year and a half, two years before this particular day, when our blessed Lord had announced that most spiritual and beautiful of all the sacraments, the Eucharist. If you look in the sixth chapter of St. John, you will find that that is where the betrayal of Judas is first noticed. When something spiritual was given. The man who is excessively fond of money for some reason or other begins to develop a heart like money or like gold. Cold and yellow. And so Judas bargained for the master and sold him for 30 pieces of silver. Never before was divinity sold at such a cheap price. As anybody who sells it, sells it cheaply. That's why he took the money back. It's always a bad bargain. When you give up your faith simply because you have the acquisitive economic spirit. <clears throat> so Judas took the money back to the, to the temple and threw the coins rolling across the temple floor. He admitted he had done wrong. I betrayed innocent blood. But he would not ask for pardon. You see, some sins end in despair. There's a creative despair. Peter sinned. 
Our Lord even called Peter a devil. Peter denied our Lord, too. Almost sold him, sold him to three women in a courtyard, said that I know not the man. But his despair was not that despair which is godless. It was creative. And so when our Lord turned and looked on Peter, Peter wept. Wept so much that tradition has it that he had furrows in his cheeks from his tears. But Judas is the materialist. And all of these characters, as you see, as well as others, sort of reveal this terrible, terrible quality of indifference that there is in human hearts. It makes little difference to what the Lord of the heavens has done. Like those gamblers, they were really the peak of that apathetic group. The gamblers, because scripture says of them, they sat and watched. Along with them were the spectators. These gamblers took out their dice, began throwing them for that seamless robe. I think the very quality of seamlessness indicated that our blessed Lord was rather poor because it was just one piece. In any case, they decided not to divide it. So four of them shook dice for the garments of the God-man. Here they were, within a stone's throw of the redemption of the world of their Savior. Why, they were so close, they could have even thrown their dice. And yet, they gambled away the time and the grace. And the spectator, Why are they there? Because people love to see violence. What's this curious thing that makes our modern mind so fond of violence? So that, for example, in some time ago, in the hours between 7 and 10, on the television stations of New York, there was either an act or a threat of violence every 43 seconds. So these spectators loved it. Interesting seeing those nails driven through hands and feet. And the body thirsting on the cross. Indifferent as to its meaning, but something about pain that gave pleasure to them. And the real reason is the people who have an undue love of violence are admitting that somewhere there's punishment needed. Retribution. But instead of making retribution and doing violence for themselves, for their own sins, they project that need of retribution on others. And so they love to see violence. Like Lady Macbeth, who was always washing her hands, to get the blood of murder off them. And 
was her soul that needed washing, not her hands. And so it's the violence to oneself and not the violence to others that the indifferent need. But since they will not see this tremendous reparation on the cross, then they take pleasure in that violence. Reminds one of one of John Galsworthy's shows. I think it was called The Show, yes. There was a scene in a coroner's, at a coroner's inquest, in a morgue. The dead husband was on the slab. His wife, who was suspected of some kind of violence in killing her husband, was on the witness stand. The coroner and the prosecuting attorney were giving her a real grilling. Finally, it finished, and the spectators left. One said to the other, you never see anything like that in the theater, do you? Real life is much more poignant than any kind of drama. Wasn't that an absorbing story? My, that was interesting. And suddenly they looked, and they saw a woman looking at them. She was dressed in black, and she just stared at them. It was the mother of the slain man. She closed her eyes and said, the show is over. Indifference to death and all of its consequences. There was a, an Episcopalian minister in World War I by the name of George Studdard Kennedy who wrote a poem once about the apathetic and the indifferent. Maybe I can remember it. It was the story of, story of Good Friday, Christ going to the cross, in contrast to our blessed Lord going to the city of Birmingham in England any one of these days. When Jesus came to Golgotha, they nailed him on a tree Crown him with a crown of thorns. Red were his wounds. And deep. For those were crude and cruel days. And human flesh was cheap. When Jesus came to Birmingham, they only passed him by. They would not hurt a hair of him. They only let him die. For men had grown more tender. They would not give him pain. They only just passed down the street and left him in the rain. So it rained. The winter rain that drenched him through and through. And when all the crowds had left the streets without a soul to see, then Jesus crouched against a wall and sighed. 
for Calvary. In other words, the crucifixion could be more readily endured than this indifference. And God said of the indifference, thou art neither hot nor cold, therefore will I vomit thee from my mouth. That was one group. Then there was another. The group that had antipathy, hatred, animosity, bitterness in their heart. And let it not be thought that they must necessarily be irreligious men. <clears throat> Bigotry can be religious. Religion today is rather comfortable. Nice signs on lawns, leave the world better than you find it, keep smiling, heads up. But suppose one brings in the cross, the divinity of Christ. How is that meant? That makes the difference. Here was Caiaphas, a religious man after a fashion. And Caiaphas was afraid of having too much divinity in religion. And so when our blessed Lord was brought before him, he said to our Lord, Art thou the Christ, the Son of the living God? And our blessed Lord answered, Thou hast said it. I am. And with that, Caiaphas reached over, took up the bottom of his robes, and rent them from bottom to top, and said, you've heard the blasphemy? This man is guilty of death. Here was a hatred that was inspired simply because all religion had to be national. Narrow, socially approved, it had to suit certain classes. But the God who has a universal interest and the Christ who comes to save the world, that is the one that has to be hated. And so you find in this anti-pathetic group uh, individuals, associations that hated one another, that bore to one another little animosities. Then when they come up against the real thing, something too big to be ignored, then they unite. You'll see that always in a great crisis. Take, for example, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. The Pharisees were very strict. They were a kind of a, of a fundamental fundamentalist, and the Sadducees were a kind of a modern modernist. They had no use for one another, doctrinally or socially. 
And yet, when it came to the person of our blessed Lord, then they united and they walked together. Pilate and Herod, they had not spoken for years. And they became friends over the bleeding and torn body of Christ. What therefore is paid to our blessed Lord on this Good Friday is the very beautiful tribute of hostility. It's only the divine that can ever make men forget their lesser hates and unite against a greater one, which is the Lord himself. And as we get closer to the cross, you find another group that are, are hateful. And that, in that group belongs the thief on the left. Here there were two thieves crucified on either side of our blessed Lord. They were both thieves. They both blasphemed at the beginning. There apparently was no difference between the two. Thief on the right changes his heart. And the thief on the left, well, he becomes the exemplar of all of those who think that the only person of religion, purpose of religion, is to get you out of pain. Religion is an insurance policy. Why should I suffer this? What did I do? And so when things go wrong, they begin to blame God. And the thief on the, on the left shouted to our blessed Lord on the central cross, said, If thou art the Son of God, save thyself and save us. In other words, if you have divine power, let's see a proof of it. You know what proof you can give. Unhang these nails. Turn that crown of thorns into a scepter of flowers. Take that nail in your right hand. Make it a scepter of power. Turn that blood into royal purple. If you're divine, but above all there's one proof you can give that will convince me and I will believe you. Take me down from this cross. If you can do it, you're God. If you cannot, you are not. And why did he want to be taken down? To go on with the dirty business of stealing. Here was the great unanswered prayer. Certainly not all prayers are answered. What did our Lord on the central cross do to deserve this? We did it, all of us. And then along with those that I already mentioned that hated, there were a group of mockers that stood at the foot of the cross. These mockers, for the most part, were, oh, kind of intelligentsia, self-wise. And they hurled a challenge at him, like the thief on the left, and a taunt. And they said, if thou art the son of God, come down from the cross. Others he saved, himself he cannot save. That was the proof they wanted to come down from the cross. In other words, give us a religion without a cross. Give us one of these nice painted things. But we do not want anyone hanging on it. It accuses us.
not anything that solves this contradiction of the vertical bar of life and that horizontal bar of death. Not that. Come down and we will believe, but he did not come down. And why not? Because if he came down, he never would have saved us. Because to come down is human. It's divine to hang there, to come into human sorrow, human iniquity, human evil, not to leave it until it is finally atoned for and healed. Others, they, he saved, they said, but himself he cannot save. Of course he cannot. The rain cannot save itself if it is to bud the greenery. The mother cannot save herself if she is to save her child. The soldier cannot save himself if he is to save his country. This is not the law of the law of weakness is the law of sacrifice. Greater love than this no man hath. That he lay down his life for his friends. But are they hopeless people? Either the apathetic or the haters. The haters perhaps have even a better chance than the indifferent. Our blessed Lord said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And when St. Peter converted thousands of them on Pentecost, he repeated that first word of our Lord on the cross, you have done it ignorantly. So there must have been some of these people whom he just described. We are never to take hate very seriously. When people hate the divinity of religion, it's really themselves they hate. I remember once, I shall not mention the city, hearing of a man who had lost his faith. He was dying in a hospital. His sister told me that he'd thrown out every priest that ever went in. She asked me to go to visit him. This man had not only lost his faith and tried to corrupt the faith, the faith of others and also morals, particularly the morals of the young. He had a very wicked and evil reputation. Well, I knew that I could fare no better than anyone else, so first night I went down, I stayed for about five seconds. I went down to see him 40 nights straight. The second night, maybe I stayed 10 seconds. Third night, maybe 20. But I never, never brought up the question of his soul. I was biding my time because I was afraid that all of that hate would come out. It came the 40th night. I brought down the holy oils to give him the sacrament of extreme unction and also the Blessed Sacrament, which we believe is our Lord himself. And I said to him, he was dying of cancer. All faces was eaten away with it, his throat, hideous sight. I said, Edward, you're going to die tonight. He said, I know it. I said, would you like to make your peace with God before you die? He said, no. Get out. I said, I'm not alone. Who's with you? I said, I, said, I brought our blessed Lord with me in the blessed sacrament. Do you want him to get out? He didn't say anything. I knelt alongside of his bed for about 30 minutes. And I promised our blessed Lord that if he would make peace with him before he died, that I would build a chapel 
about $6,000, which I could ill afford, a $6,000 chapel in one of the mission lands. So when I got up, I said, again, Edward, you want to make your peace with God, don't you? He said, no, get out. And I said, do you want the Lord to get out too? He said, yes. And he started screaming for the nurse. To stop his screaming, I quickly ran to the door. And he stopped screaming, and I took advantage of the moment of silence to dash back quickly, and I laid my head alongside of his cancerous head. And I said, Edward, before you die, please say, my Jesus' mercy, forgive me my sin. He said, I will not get out and scream for the nurse. I told the nurse I would come in any hour of the night he wanted. She called me about four o'clock in the morning and told me that he had just died. I said, how did he die? She said, about a minute or two after you left. He began saying, my Jesus mercy. Forgive me my sins. He kept saying it on and on until the moment of his death. But it cost something. It cost me 40 visits. I'm not speaking economically, spiritually. It cost a lot of prayer. Cost chapel. That's one soul. Now, when you think of our blessed Lord redeeming you and me and all the other souls in the world, you have some idea of how much it cost. So there's hope for the apathetic. There's hope for the hater. But then, beautifully, of course, there was the third group, and that's the group that has sympathy. Sometimes understanding, sometimes less understanding. One who was very sympathetic was the wife of Claudia Prokel. I mean, the wife of Pontius Pilate, whose name was Claudia Prokel. I think, though we know only a few lines about her in the scriptures, she's really one of the charming women. You never find, in this crisis of our Lord, a single woman failing. <coughs> women failed. Men failed, but women never failed. It was Pilate's wife who, who broke the rigors of Roman justice and went into the courtroom and said to her, husband that she was troubled about that just man in a dream. She begged him not to sentence him to death. And then another sympathetic soul who came to freedom by compulsion was a man from Africa. I find it very interesting that the first man who ever halved or shared the cross of Christ was an African. We do not know what kind of an African he was, but the long arm of the Roman law reached out to him and said, carry that cross. He did not want to carry it. Following in the footsteps of our Lord, he began to love it. That's when the cross does really become lovable. And he had two sons, Alexander and Rufinus, who became bishops of the early church. Simon of Cyrene will always be the man who enters into the faith through some reluctance 
finds it sweet. The imposed cross the Lord gives. Young couple, couple in middle age, man or woman entering into a career, trial to anyone. They're made other assignments. Love cannot kill pain. Love can make it bearable. Then there are the women. Women who comforted our Lord. And here we get misplaced sympathy. All of the good, fine, feminine qualities of these women came out. Namely, they wished to wipe away the blood and sweat and the tears of our blessed Lord as he went to Calvary. But our Lord turned to them and said, Weep not for me. Weep for yourselves. In other words, weep not for the crucified. Weep for the crucifiers. I am innocent. I am not forced to take this cross for love of men. But weep for your sins, weep for your city. Oh, how many false tears there are shed in the world, in theaters, over a novel, weeping, weeping for others. And then another sympathetic soul was the thief on the right. One of the really beautiful characters that comes out of this great tragedy. As I said, he was just the same as the thief at the left at the very beginning. But hearing the words of our Lord on the cross, for example, Father, forgive them. There was some inflammable material already in his heart. And then he looked over to the thief on the left as much as he could. <clears throat> Heard him blaspheming, and he said, he said, do you not fear, seeing that we receive the just reward of our deeds? We were murderers and thieves. This is what we deserve. Sin as its punishment. That's something people fail to realize. The modern tendency to deny guilt. They love to call it by another name. Or deny it altogether. They never think of making up, making up for sin. Suppose every time you did wrong, you drove a nail into a board. And every time you were forgiven, you pulled the nail out. You would have a hole left in the board. But you've been forgiven. What's that hole there? How is it to be filled? It is to be filled by some penance, by reparation. I'm very interested, for example, in, among other things, in the poor of all the world, but in lepers. So I remember being in Africa, the leper colony in Bulaba, not very long ago, and I was giving crosses to the lepers, and I saw a leper with, oh, a white festered, awful-looking hand, and I dropped the cross in it. And the moment I dropped the cross in it, I said to myself, oh, I'm the worst, the worst of all, the worst of all. Because here I fail to share the suffering with others. And then I, I reach down my hand and put it on the cross and put it on the hand of the suffering man. 
Oh, you think that's something. But it's nothing to Christ who reached out to take our hearts and our souls. May he forgive us all. Bye. And God love you. The evening light begins to paint the Jerusalem sky. His crowned head is now bowed in grief and loss. The twilight winds carried his last human cry. It is finished. Gently, we take him from his cross. Fulton J. Sheen is indeed a man for all seasons. He walked a paced beat, allowing us to glimpse his nature and ponder its worth and to enjoy its presence. Bishop Sheen authored over 90 books. He broadcast countless radio and television programs and ministered in many parts of the world to people of every belief. As he said many times, it is not a unity of religion we plead for, but a unity of religious people. We may not be able to meet in the same pew, but we can meet on our knees.